to be afraid Nothing is as powerful as his love Oh, the way he gave his son To give life to everyone Not a thing can separate us from his love Forgiveness that leads us to sin My 
heartbeat today Oh, free 
takes the power of sin and darkness Whose love is mighty and so much stronger The King of glory, the King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder And leaves his presence in awe and wonder The King of glory, the King above all kings This is amazing grace This is a burning love That you would take my faith Name is 
Bless the rest of this worship and this time of greeting, Lord. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and greet each other. Thank <laughs> you. 
death it claimed its victim. in history They're on the cross they made for sin For every curse his blood atoned And final breath and it was finished At the end For the earth began to shake, and the veil was torn. What sacrifice was made, as the heavens rolled. Oh, that no other before you performed, raising self from the grave, Lord, for you could not be held by death. You were sinless, and yet you died for us sinners. But we scoffed and we, and we hated you. You loved us first. 
We thank you and we honor you this day. Please prepare our hearts to hear from your word, Lord. Make us moldable. Make us teachable. Let us grow in our walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? All right. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand and one will be brought to you. If you have a cell phone, make sure that you turn it off or put it in silent mode um, if, if you use it as a, as, your, as a Bible. Also, uh, upcoming next, next Sunday, uh, our brothers and sisters from Rock Island will be coming up to uh, share in the time of worship and, and the word. So that should be a blessing. Uh, we do have uh, a bus f- uh, a bus full coming up again, so praise the Lord for that. Also, if you have some, maybe some clothes, and you've been thinking about, uh, go ahead, you know, getting rid of them, please bring them in, and we'll get those to those guys as well. And also, if, if you have some light cooking utensils, pans, silverware, stuff like that, that maybe the Lord has laid on your heart to get rid of too, they will take those as well. And uh, then... Uh, that should be a, a, a real blessing for that. The Prophecy Conference in Appleton, starting uh, April 26th through the 28th. Uh, Pastor Jeff will be one of the teachers there. The, there is more information about the conference and who's going to be there on the App, uh, Calvary Chapel Appleton website. Um, the schedule is not up yet, but the, you will be able to find out who is, who is going to be participating in that. And also, Saturday, May 18th, we will be having the creation extravaganza, and we will be getting, so save that day. Uh, it, uh, it should be a, a real blessing to be able to uh, have that as well, so just keep that in mind. And uh, with that, also, eggs and Chick-fil-A. So we're not going to answer that question, which came first, but... There is plenty of that. Please take some um, for, for yourself, your neighbors, especially your neighbors, those in need that you know that would be blessed uh, to be able to, to have even just, you know, a dozen eggs to help them get through the week. And so this has been, you know, the Lord has opened the door for us to be able to, to do that. So please, you know, partake in that as well. Uh, if you need to know where they're at, you can... Uh, see myself or um, Alicia Secretis, and she can uh, help help out with that. Show you where it's at um, to be able to get that food uh, f- um, to, to you know to help out your you know your neighbors or even uh, you know you know your brothers and sisters as well. So um, then also uh, still tentative plan for March 20th, the 17th to the 28th of 2025. Uh, this is the Israel trip, and so just keep that in prayer. If that's something the Lord has laid on your heart, um, you can see see myself for more information with that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that we have to come together and to to worship you, God. And uh, we know we we celebrate your your day, your death every day, Lord. But God, today is a day, Lord, that God, you've provided for us, Lord, so that we can be here. Lord, if it wasn't for you dying on the cross and, and you know, defeating death and raising, rising again, Lord, none of us would, would even be here right now, Lord. God, we just thank you for your, your love that you, you, you've given to us um, through your son dying on the cross. God, just be with our pastor this morning, Lord, as he shares your word, being led by the Holy Spirit, Lord, the same Holy Spirit who's our guide and is our teacher. Lord, that we would receive uh, from that word uh, to help us to grow in, in our walks, Lord, to help us to understand, Lord, what it, what it means to be a, a believer, a follower of Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 15 this morning. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Someone will bring one. If you have to leave, just sit outside in that dining area there and... If you want to donate, there's a box in the back. 
There's uh, multiple Bible studies throughout the week. Uh, what Brian didn't say, if you're uh, just visiting or you haven't been here before, Rock Island Church is a busload of uh, African refugees who will be coming here. And they'll do, be doing a lot of the worship in Swahili, and there will be uh, interpreters, and it is fantastic time. It is just a total blessing. If you want to just see people on fire for the Lord, you're going to meet people who a month or two ago were being persecuted in parts of Africa and through a world relief organization. They've been brought here and set free, and they just want to worship the Lord. So it's very infectious if you want to be part of that. And uh, like I said, we'll go through, we go through the Old Testament on um, Wednesday nights. We go through prophecy on Friday nights. We have services as well. Normally, we are in the New Testament here on Sunday mornings. We just started the book of Revelation last week, but we're taking a break because of the day it is. And Lord, we do give you all the glory and praise. Thank you, Lord, for rising from the grave. That means, Lord, we will too. Lord, there is life beyond this earthly tent and god is we see the world just devolving into chaos confusion wars and immorality and just the craziness god we know that the end is near and so that's the end for those who don't know you for those of us it'll just be the beginning and so we look forward to your return come quickly lord jesus in your name amen first corinthians 15 verse 35 but someone will say how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. The Apostle Paul here just speaking how a body is put in the ground, but what rises from the dead is nothing like what is put in the ground. What you sow, verse 37, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat, some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of man, another flesh of animals, another fish, another birds. There are also celestial bodies, terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption, it is sown in dishonor, raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. Sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body, there's a spiritual body, and also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those uh, who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So in the midst of his teaching on resurrection here in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul makes a comparison between Jesus and Adam. The first man, Adam, became a living being, he says in verse 45. The last Adam, verse 45, speaking of Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. The Apostle Paul compares the Lord Jesus Christ and the glorified heavenly state that he was resurrected to, compares that to Adam and the physical state that he was created in, doing so so as to bring greater clarity. I mean, this was all new there in the first century. People are hearing about there was some guy in Jerusalem who was buried three days in a tomb and came walking out. And over 500 people had seen him, 500 witnesses. This was, uh, what's going on? You know, so Paul breaks this down years later. He is breaking down biblically. His people have a difficult time understanding resurrection, how this physical body dies, is buried only to be raised up in glory. Well, this natural body comes first, and then the spiritual body. The body I have now is created to only live 
on this physical earth. It's made of dust, as Adam was, verse 47, formed from the dust of the earth. The same earthly elements, the same minerals that make up dirt. You hate to burst anyone's bubble, but dude, that is the same thing that makes up your body. They're just a glorified dirt ball, I hate to tell you that. <laughs> But, you know, the whole outer surface of a person's body, the outer skin cells are replaced every month with over a million pieces of dead skin being shed every hour. It's going to be a big pile in here after this is over. But when you wipe that dust off the shelf or off the table in your house, you're cleaning up the fragments of your former self. It's like silently, without even thinking about it, every person is turning back into dust your whole life. But the resurrected body that believers will receive after we die or are raptured, that body will be a heavenly body comparable to the body Jesus had after his resurrection. Jesus would just show up in the middle of a locked room. He would go from Galilee to Jerusalem like that. He was interdimensional somehow. But these are just what the Gospels portray. It's as though my relationship with the first man, Adam, the physical man, that I am in a position, it is through that I'm in a position of even having an eternal relationship with God. The second Adam, as Jesus is called here in verse 47, so as to not only bear the image of this earthly man, this body of dust, but to now, verse 49, also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now, to better understand this, turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. It's a very easy book to find. Go to the front cover and turn right, and you'll find Genesis very quickly. If you get to the table of contents, keep going. It's a little further. Genesis Chapter 2. Here in the creation account of human beings, it says in chapter 2, verse 4 of Genesis, this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, being a pastor here in Madison 26 years, I've had the opportunity over those years of having professors like David Spooner, many of you know, who got saved. I've had several who show up from the university wanting to debate the accuracy of the Bible. Their problem is that they approach the Bible thinking that it claims to be the source of all knowledge. And they're surprised to find out that it doesn't. Many times they're disappointed to find out that the Bible doesn't give specific answers to scientific questions. It's not that the Bible contradicts science, it doesn't. It's just that the Bible explains creation and the origin of everything within the context of redemption. The Bible never claims to be a textbook on science, although there's a lot of fascinating science in it. But it deals with something much more complex and of much more essential nature to human life here on earth and that is our purpose for existence and our destiny as human beings some professor of biology from the university can explain to me all the functions of human anatomy he can use a microscope and study dna and tell me how the cells in my body operate very impressive but he has no clue why they exist why they operate in the first place it's like, what's the purpose? Just to live and die? And that's pretty much their answer, yep. That's pretty sad. Then it said, someone once said, you know, if, I guess if we're just a product of evolution, humanity's only purpose on the evolutionary chain has been to introduce plastic into the environment. And then it's, you know, it go extinct. And that's pretty much our value then. 
being some brilliant scientist who can't even tell me why I exist. It's like being able to describe all the parts of a beautiful chair has four legs, carved cross pieces holding them together, it has a seat and a cushion, armrests on each side, a curved back, comfortable headrest on top. Imagine someone knowing all the parts, this beautiful chair, who's never sat in it before. That's what many of the professors I've talked to are like. You don't even know what life is for. Yet as someone who sits in the chair, relaxes, and enjoys the purpose for which a chair is made, I can appreciate its construction all the more, fascinated by it, more than someone who only knows what it is made out of, but has never experienced its purpose. In the same way, knowing the purpose for why God has created me provides me with the ability to live life here on earth to its fullest, to a far greater extent, even beyond this life than someone who can just tell me how it works, but doesn't even know why. The specific act of God's creation of the first human being, it's mentioned in chapter one of Genesis, is just one part of a larger creation account of all of the physical creation. In chapter two here, the purpose for God's creation of human beings is introduced. When he says in verse 5, before any plant of the field was in the earth, before any herb of the field, so no plants, because God did not cause it to rain yet on the earth. There was no man to till the ground to take care of the plants. But a mist went up from the earth, watered the whole face of the ground. It was at that point the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward of Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So here in the creation account of Genesis, things come down to a specific spot here on earth. It's like having Google Maps of the entire universe beginning there in Genesis 1-1. God created the heavens and the earth, the whole universe. And then it narrows down immediately from the whole universe to just one earth, Genesis 1-2, this one planet out of the entire universe. Now in chapter 2, the Bible focuses in on one particular area of planet Earth, an area within which there's a garden. This is a garden God himself is going to plant. He's not going to plant tomatoes and cucumbers and you know, lettuce, stuff like that. This is a garden where God will plant the first human being so as to begin the process of redemption. As I pointed out before, redemption is God's primary cause. It is his primary purpose for the creation of this planet. You know, when people fell, when sin entered in, it wasn't like God going, oh, what, what am I going to do now? This was all worked into the whole concept and the whole plan of redemption. God knew ahead of time. Jesus Christ is called the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world, Revelation 13. In 1 Peter 1, Jesus' death on the cross was already factored in before human beings were made. It's as though God's personal act of the Son of God, God himself coming to redeem, it's through that we as human beings find our ultimate fulfillment and our purpose in glory with God. Our whole purpose isn't to just live and die and get thrown into some boneyard here on earth. But in order to redeem something, in order to save something that has been lost or fix something that's broken, it's got to become lost or broken first. And so Genesis 2 of, uh, here in, recounts this perfect conditions that God placed Adam in at the beginning. Verse 5, once again, it's written in a way that's anticipating what comes next. This kind of writing here in Hebrew literature, it's used to emphasize the importance of what is taking place. It could have just said, and God made a man, and man messed everything up, so God had to fix it. But it doesn't say that. Language is used to express how valuable this whole creation is. I mean, God is very powerful. The Bible goes on to say he's going to create multiple universes in ages to come. This isn't just the only one. You look around, dude, look how powerful God must be to be able to call this all into being. The Bible says in ages to come, 
We're going to experience new creations if I desire to. He's not forcing anybody to do anything. It's just saying here, man was put in here. Man, language is used to express how valuable this main component to God's creation is this man, Adam. It's going to show how devastating the fall is in chapter 3. All of it is used to introduce the need for redemption because when this physical creation is done with its purpose and the Bible says that it's folded up like a garment using poetic language, the only thing that is going to continue to exist is going to be redeemed human beings, glorified human beings. And so this is all introduced to show this need which provides humanity the ability to be resurrected to a glorified body one day. Now I pointed out before, God has made creatures like angels who are glorified to begin with. But it is through this redemption process, becoming physical and sinning and then being saved by my God personally when he comes to the cross so that I can be resurrected to a glorified body. It is through that whole process that we achieve a greater relationship with our creator than even angels. Because I'm provided with an opportunity to serve God or not. He's not forcing anybody. It's like, dude, if you don't want to be in heaven, if you don't want to praise God and hang around other people who do, you'd hate heaven anyway. That's all they do there, man. I hate to tell you. They don't have porn shops and, and liquor stores, you know. It's all about God. That's what heaven is. And I'm given the option to be glorified or not. So a field is introduced in verse 5. No plants, just barren, because there was no rain and no, nor any man to care for the plants until the ground. The first Adam, as he's called in 1 Corinthians 15, will not be responsible to till the entire planet. You got a field here, okay? You just take care of this one field. He couldn't even do that. But neither could you or I, I guarantee it. But having everything prepared for Adam ahead of time, it says there in verse 7, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living being. So both physical and spiritual components of the first human being are introduced. The physical is formed from the dust of the ground. That's why a body will just go back to being ashes and dust. You know, it's made up of the same material ultimately. It'll just decompose. The spiritual is breathed into his nostrils. So the spiritual isn't formed like the physical body, but the part of man that makes the physical body into a living being, verse 7, that is delivered directly from God. God breathes into Adam, Adam's full personality that corresponds directly then to God's personality, at least originally, in his relationship to his eternal creator. And so a very important verse there, verse 7, shows the beginning of man's physical mortal nature as well as his spiritual immortal nature. It's through that combination of the spiritual and, and the physical that we as human beings have been specially equipped by God personally to bridge, in a sense, the physical and the spiritual. Like I said, there are physical people and there are spiritual beings. Colossians 1.16 says, Jesus created all things that are in heaven and on earth, both visible and invisible. The invisible, at least to us, because we don't live in the spiritual realm, the invisible spiritual realm consists of immortal spiritual beings such as angels there's all sorts of them living creatures seraphim cherubim fallen angels called demons and who knows what else like i said god's very creative the visible physical realm consists of a multitude of physical creatures you got lions and zebras and elephants and birds and fish reptiles insects very diverse but as human beings we are unique amongst all of God's creatures, visible, invisible, physical, spiritual. We are unique in that God created the first man, Adam, with physical 
as well as spiritual nature. And he became a living being, verse 7. To have God breathe that life into him is what it speaks about in chapter 1, verse 26 here in Genesis, when it says that through his creative act, God created the first Adam in his image according to his likeness. To be created in God's image speaks of the spiritual attributes that would be shared between God and Adam. For God is spirit, Jesus says in John chapter 4. Adam was given spiritual attributes directly by God, which provide human beings the ability to be in a relationship with him. The first Adam was created with the ability to understand divine truths, such as justice, righteousness, love, many others. To be in possession of that kind of understanding is what it means to be created in God's image. Dogs have no concept of justice. You have a big dog and a little dog, and you throw them one bone, the bigger one's going to win, I guarantee you. The smaller one isn't going to appeal to a court of justice of some sort. And, you know, I have no fair. Now, you got one piece of candy and you got two children. You have a court case on your hands if you're a parent. You got no fair. He got the last one. No, I didn't. You did. Besides, you always get the last one. No, I don't. It's just, if you're a parent, you know it is, that's what drives you insane. <laughs> Human beings have built-in attributes such as justice, fairness, righteousness. To be created in God's likeness, chapter 126 says, not that we look like him, refers to the ability of human beings to think abstractly, to create from imagination. I can just think of something and create it up. Our artists to express my personality in different ways. We can only imagine what the original relationship between Adam and God consisted of at that point because we're not given much detail, but it must have been extremely special and incredibly close because the break in that relationship destroyed everything. All we're told here is the first Adam became a living being which is what the Apostle Paul refers to. Turn back to 1 Corinthians 15 in the New Testament. As Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 15 in his teaching on resurrection, it was God's design from the beginning for human beings created in his image after his likeness to be resurrected unto eternal existence. Some people, they want to try and live forever here on this planet. They don't want to go to heaven. They got enough money. Oracle co-founder co -founder Larry Ellison of Oracle, he spent over $430 million on anti-aging research, over $200 million on his Cancer Institute at the University of Southern California. He's quoted as saying, death never made any sense to me. Well, it doesn't make sense to God either, but you know, you ask for it. Google founder Sergey Brin and Larry Page, they founded a $1.5 billion life extension company focusing on genetic research and development of pharmaceuticals targeting diseases associated with old age. Good luck, man. Jeff Bezos of Amazon has invested hundreds of millions of dollars into Unity Biotechnology, a company targeting cellular mechanisms at the root of age-related diseases. Dave Asprey is a creator of Bulletproof Coffee, takes over 150 supplements a day. Dude, that's like a full-time job. <laughs> he believes he's going to live to 180 years old. Dude, I don't want to live that long, you know. <laughs> but he's invested millions. You can go on and on. It was never God's intention for human beings to just live and die on this physical planet in this physical body. Obviously. You see that every time you go past a cemetery, you know, that's what you're destined to. God's intended purpose has always been for humanity to undergo this physical experience first here on planet Earth in preparation for being brought into glory through the process of resurrection. As the Bible says that Jesus was the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. 
It is from this initial earthly state that my glorified eternal existence with God originates. Look at verse 42 of 1 Corinthians 15. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, raised in glory, sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. There is a spiritual body. So the body is sown. It's not buried, notice. It's sown like a seed in the hopes of bringing forth new life. Having borne the image of the man of dust, as Adam's called in verse 49, a, a born-again believer will also bear the image, verse 49 says, of the heavenly man, the resurrected, glorified Christ. As Paul explains here, there's a natural body, verse 44. There's a spiritual body, he says in verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, like we saw in Genesis 2. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. Now, several years ago, in a famous museum in New York, a large statue of a human being, this thing's huge, it was carved out of marble, and it was called Adam. This huge statue, hundreds of years old, it fell over and smashed into a million pieces while no one was in the room. The people who worked at the museum, at first they thought that somebody had snuck in there and pushed it over. But it was finally determined that the statue had buckled under its own weight. Adam had self-destructed. The director of the museum told the news that it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of people, but we think we can piece this statue back together. That was never God's plan for the first Adam. The first human being to just keep piecing them back together physically after the fall. Paul quotes Genesis 2, 3 there in verse 45, how that the first man, Adam, became a living being. Literally, he was created a life-having being, a being who has life, not just, just a, a shell with, a, with spiritual life. God formed a physical body out of the dust, and he breathed life into it. The last Adam... As Jesus is called in verse 45, is the one who gives resurrected life. There's no verb became in the original Greek in verse 45. If you have a Bible, it's in italics because there's no verb there. Because he didn't become anything. Christ has always existed. He is eternal in his nature, no beginning, no end. Not only has he always existed, but he has always been the giver of life, physical and spiritual. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through him. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 3 says, speaking of Jesus Christ, all things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. Colossians 1.15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, so all the angelic host, all things were created through him and for him. It says in John's Gospel, chapter 20, after Jesus had risen from the dead, he breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit, John chapter 20, verse 22. As the one who gave Adam physical life in the first place, breathed life into him, so too only Christ, the Son of God, the last Adam, only he can again give life to that which is lost. But not just earthly life as the first Adam received, but through the Lord's incarnation and his, his sacrificial atonement on the cross, experiencing death himself for me and for anybody else who will receive his gift, tasting death for everyone, he, Hebrews 2.9 says, he subjected himself to, to the same physical nature we have. Imagine that. He created it all. He's got the power to enter it if he so chooses. He has that kind of power to take upon himself a physical nature and enter into his very creation, subjected himself to the same physical nature, 
His outer skin cells were falling off just like anybody else's for 33 years. That through his death, Hebrews 2.14, he could destroy him who had the power of death, which is the devil, so as to release those who through fear of death, their whole lives subject to fear. You know, as a pastor, I sit with, I've sat with a lot of people on their deathbed, and you can tell if somebody is saved or not. If somebody is not saved, they are scared to death, literally. They go to death frightened. But I also sat with believers with huge smiles on their faces, just, man, I am going home. Come, Lord Jesus, and come take me. This is what, Jesus, this is what the Lord, he destroyed there on the cross. If you're born again, you know it, dude. You know that I have no fear of death whatsoever. I've been made alive already. I'm just waiting for this flesh to get thrown in the ground to be with the Lord. Through his sacrifice, he has been raised. He himself was raised to newness of life, to a glorified body, so that those who have been united together in the likeness of his death, Romans 6, 5, certainly we shall be united together in the likeness of his resurrection. Romans chapter 6, the last Adam is a life-giving spirit. However, verse 46 says, the spirit is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. This is presented as just the general law in God's earthly plan of salvation. First comes the natural, you're born into a physical body, and then the spiritual in that order. Jesus put it, speaking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 6, he told this religious leader who was saying, I don't understand this either. Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh, some little infant who's born physically, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Unless someone is born of water and spirit, unless they are born again, born a second time, they cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You think, what an amazing revelation is presented here in the Bible of God's creative genius. Calls into being this physical, time-oriented earth that's spinning around at 1,000 miles an hour, and it's going 66,000 miles per hour around the sun at the same time. You think we'd be going, whoa, dude, this is incredible. <laughs> you get in an airplane, and you're just hanging on for dear life. Something man makes, not God. Is a, it is a precision instrument. And he makes this physical, time-oriented earth from which to draw forth a new order of eternal spiritual life, redeemed, resurrected, glorified human beings. And when he is done with it, it says in Revelation that it's completely done away with. We enter in this new order of eternal life that he himself entered into this very creation so as to personally redeem. As Paul puts it in verse 47 right here, the first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man, Jesus Christ, is the Lord from heaven. See, Jesus wasn't simply another human being whose existence began here on earth. While he was fully human, he was also fully divine. Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, Philippians 2, 6 says, who being in his intrinsic nature divine, pre-existing in a divine nature, no beginning, no end, Philippians 2 says he made himself, he humbled himself, and made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming to the earth in the likeness of humanity. That's normally not one of the attributes of God people think of. He's all-powerful. He's omniscient. He's also humble. And that's where Satan, when he tempted him in the garden, he said, dude, the day you eat of this, you're going to become like God. He's appealing to their pride. They're going to be, you know, all-powerful. They ate from him, and guess what? That's not what God's like. God is humble. He humbled. He's willing to humble himself for sinful creatures who will nail him to a cross. And as they're nailing him, he'll say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He made himself of no reputation. Philippians 2, it is due to that divine nature 
that our Lord Jesus Christ possesses because the one hanging on the cross was eternal in his fundamental nature. Because of that, he alone is able to give me eternal life. He's able to give to those who ask the same eternal life, not divinity, not becoming God, but the ability to live forever beyond this earthly existence. All the first Adam, all that guy could give me, who was of the earth, all he could give me was a physical life, nothing more. That's all he was able to pass along. There's no parallel, you notice in verse 47 here. There's a series of parallels in this passage up to this verse. You look at verse 44, it's sown in natural body, it's raised spiritual body. There's a natural and there's a spiritual. Verse 45, so it's written, the first man became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The spiritual is not first, verse 46, but the natural, and afterward, the spiritual. Spiritual, natural, life-having, life-giving, first Adam, last Adam. But there's no parallel in verse 47. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man came from heaven. See, the first man was of the earth, made of dust. Second man doesn't say he was of heaven, made of heaven. That would be the continuation of the parallel. It's just the second man is the Lord who came from heaven. The same one who made the earth from which the first Adam was formed so as to breathe life into him. He is the one who came from heaven so as to also provide everlasting life to whoever would ask. But see, I got to humble myself too and say, God, I need you. I can't do it. And a lot of people think they can do it. Sorry, you can't. And so Paul's conclusion here, he says in verse 48, as the man of dust, as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now he's speaking to believers here. Speaking to those who are saying, Paul, I don't understand how the resurrection's going to work. And he's explaining. Adam was given, and Adam passed along a body meant strictly for this earth. Created out of the earth, for the earth, having no destiny beyond this earth. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. That nature has been passed along to billions of people. After him, making him our figurehead, so to speak, our first parent, Christ came from outside of this time-oriented planet, from a timeless heaven, so as to undergo the greatest and most important transformation of human life necessary. From cor corruptible, he came and took on a corruptible body, but he was transformed from corruptible to incorruptible, from temporal back to timeless. Only in his case, he who was incorruptible to begin with took upon himself a corruptible flesh so as to be sown in corruption, verse 42, buried in a dead body in a tomb, only to be raised unto eternal incorruption once again, the former state he was in. Christ came from heaven so as to undergo that transformation himself and become what is called the second Adam, a new father figure, so that he could pass that along to whoever wished to follow him. The way Adam passed corruption along to us, whether I like it or not, that's what this body is. It is going to decay, get old, and fall into the ground. But Christ, the Lord from heaven, verse 47, provided the ability, the power of God for those who are his to take that final step into glory with a new body if I choose. Again, he's not forcing anybody. He's not forcing anything. But he is the figurehead of a new family. Jesus said, you know, in John chapter 3, he told Nicodemus, you know, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son into the world that whoever believes on him will never perish but have everlasting life. And then he said, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. He sent his son into the world to save the world. The world's condemned. That's why it's dying. That's why everything, dude, you put, you put you know, something there on the shelf and you give it a thousand years, it's going to decay. 
Well, the second law of thermodynamics, dude, I hate to tell you, everything is dying. He came to save people. You want to go down with the ship? Dude, you're welcome to it. But he's provided through his resurrection, and he's the one who walked out of a tomb and showed there is life beyond this world. Greater life, and it's the life we are destined for. And the assurance is given here in verse 49, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Verse 50 is a summary statement of everything the Apostle Paul has been teaching here with regards to resurrection while also introducing what is new revelation, a mystery, he calls it, in verse 51. He, said, he says, Behold, I'll tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. He's not talking about the nursery ministry, okay? <laughs> we shall all, no, they're not going to sleep, we shall all be changed. He's speaking about death. There will be some believers whose physical earthly bodies will function right up until the transformation from physical to eternal when that takes place in an event that has come to be known as the rapture of the church. We will all be changed, he says in verse 51. All will be transformed into a glorified state. All believers will undergo the transformation that Paul's been speaking about through resurrection from natural to spiritual. If I'm still on the earth at the time that the rapture takes place, that transformation will take place. And guess what? At that time, it'll be too late. And everything that is going on in the world right now, I implore you, study this book. If you do not know the Lord, if you do know him, the things that are going on with Israel, the immorality going on in society where people are just so confused, upside down, that is not a, a, some, something that's a surprise. That's why we study prophecy on Friday nights. There's multiple wars going on right now, a main one between Israel and Gaza, and the entire world is lining up around Israel. The Bible predicts that multiple places. It says before the Lord comes back for his church, the whole world is going to become anti-Semitic and, and gang up on Israel. Wow, guess what? I read the news every day. That's amazing, because 100 years ago, there was no Israel. A hundred years ago, there was no nation of Israel. A hundred years ago, even 50 years ago, there was no capital of Jerusalem of Israel. They took that in 1967. These are all things that are happening very quickly. Right before our eyes, we are living in amazing times. And there's going to be a transformation. You wake up one day and they're going, I don't know, all these people kind of disappeared. <laughs> At that point, beg God for forgiveness and mercy. But I beg you now, dude, take that step now. An incredible change is going to play, take place. It's a settled fact. It was foretold in the Hebrew Scriptures. He quotes Scripture here in verse 53. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when the, the corruptible has put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying. This is a verse from Isaiah that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death is swallowed up in victory, he says in verse 54. That's a verse from Isaiah 52, 8. Where the prophet Isaiah, he was speaking of how God would overcome the attempted destruction of the children of Israel by the Assyrian army, which God did. Paul takes that verse and he applies it here to all of God's children and all who would try to overcome us. Also quoting from Hosea chapter 13 verse 14, a verse in which God says that he will ransom his people from the power of death in the grave. Literally, in that passage in Hosea, God is proclaiming through the prophet that he, God, will personally be death's destroyer. God said, I'm not going to just send another prophet. I will personally destroy death. And that he, God, personally would bring the grave's destruction. That is what God has done through the cross 
of the second Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ. As he says there, death has been swallowed up in victory, verse 54. That's not just saying that the effects of death have been taken away. This is what's so amazing when you study this. Death has not just been conquered by God, but as only God himself can do and as he has always done through the cross, God has personally taken what was meant for evil, death itself, and he's turned it for good. Death has become an integral part in achieving the victory. God has turned death, the death of this earthly body, God has transformed that event into his instrument for achieving everlasting life for born-again human beings. It's like, take that, Satan. You know, he's one brought death into the world. God used death to bring these people into glory. He has brought victorious results out of what at first appeared to be devastating blow. You talk about crushing the serpent's head, as it says there in Genesis 3.15. Death has been swallowed up. It has been absorbed into the full progression of God's ultimate plan for those created in his image with his likeness. Death now actually provides the access I need to be glorified. It is through death that I have the access now unto a place of glory with, with the Lord. And as Paul ends here in verse 57, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, it's a great, uh, a great, uh, way to encourage people my beloved brother and believers be steadfast be immovable always abounding in the work of the lord knowing that your labor is not in vain in the lord do we have a purpose you know you hate to tell some professor i had those debates with david spooner before he got saved he would come with all his arguments about the flood and everything else and i'm just some you know i'm not a professor but I just show them what the Bible says, and these people walk away just frustrated. Because, dude, they know everything. They got everything. They got a mansion. They got all the money, but they got no purpose for life. And they're looking at some guy who just gets saved out of nothing, has nothing, but has the greatest joy and peace, dude, I ever knew in my whole life. And you can have it too, man. If you do not know the Lord here today, I implore you. Be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. God made the first step. The ball is in your court, basically. All you need to do is pray to him, God, forgive me. I am a sinner. I, I confess, Lord, that I am a sinful person. I repent. I turn from it. God, give me this new life through Jesus Christ. I will follow you. Lord, the rest of my days, fill me with your spirit so I have the strength to do so. You pray a prayer like that. God, it's not some magic prayer. God looks upon your heart. If you're here today, you don't know the Lord, you want to, come up front here. We'll be up here. We'll pray with you. We'd love to minister to you, give you a Bible. If you want a Bible, we'll give them away free. Lord, we thank you for what you've given us through your Son. We thank you, Lord, how you have redeemed us. You've given us new life already. God, I can't wait for the glorified version. Can't wait for the glorified model when this physical aching tent, it just keeps getting worse and worse. God, I can't wait for it to be thrown in the ground and receive the new model there in heaven. Until then, God, we just want to serve you and praise you until the day you take us home. Maybe it would be today. We don't know. You do, Lord, and so we just trust you. We give you all the glory, all the praise, for you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we're going to stand, we're going to have a final song, and then we're going to pray. If you're not used to praying, you can just stand there and agree in, in prayer, but it'll be a, a special time.
the rest of this day. Um, bless this prayer. Uh, keep us on one accord, Lord, and bless the rest of the fellowship and um, everything else today. Lord, we just love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and pray with each other.